Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number 10, titled Lessons of the Past, ready for teaching on March 9. It's from the Sabbath School Lesson series on Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're about to open your word again this week as we study the Sabbath School lesson. We find in your word just so many things that bless us and encourage us. And this week we'll be looking at lessons from the past expressed in the book of Psalms. And as we do so, we pray that we may take from the past those things which are blessings and benefits to us now and in the future and Use them to be able to help others and help ourselves in our walk with you, knowing all the time that we depend totally upon you and upon the Holy Spirit to guide and to bless. We thank you for the salvation that Jesus has offered by his life, his death, his resurrection. And Lord, we just pray that as we open your word this week, you'll be with us. And I'd particularly like to pray for Wilson Agonda from Kenya and Emma and her family from Texas and Vanessa Quenda from Zambia and her resolve and those who are vision impaired, Lord, and those who are blind who are using this service. I pray that each one may be blessed as your word is open to them and also for those who are using these readings as a way to learn English. Lord, we each need you for some reason at all. And as we study this word this week, we pray that each of us may be fully blessed in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 78, verses 3 and 4. Which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Let's read that again, Psalm 78, verses 3 and four, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the blessings of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. In numerous psalms, praise takes the form of narrating the Lord's mighty acts of salvation. These psalms are often called salvation history psalms or historical psalms. Some appeal to God's people, telling them to learn from their history, particularly from their and their ancestors' mistakes. Certain historical psalms contain a predominant hymnal note that highlights God's past wonderful deeds on behalf of God's people and that strengthen their trust in the Lord, who is able and faithful to deliver them from their present hardships. The special appeal of the historical psalms is that they help us to see our lives as part of the history of God's people and to claim that past as our own. As we have been adopted into the family of the historic people of God through Christ, as you read in Romans and Galatians, the historical heritage of the ancient people of Israel is indeed the account of our spiritual ancestry. Let's read those texts in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And Romans 9, verses 24 to 26, Even as whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. 
Therefore, we can and should learn from their past, which is ours as well. The final goal is to realise that each generation of God's people plays a small but significant part in the grand historical unfolding of God's sovereign purposes in the Great Controversy. Sunday, March 3, The Lord's Unstoppable Faithfulness Read Psalm 78, what three key historical epochs are highlighted in this psalm. What recurring lessons does Asaph draw from each period? Let's read Psalm 78, and I'll just remind you it's a fairly long psalm, but worth reading. It's titled, A Contemplation of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God, they refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works, and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvellous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness, and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock, and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock, so that the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings. So they ate and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. When he slew them, Then they sought him, and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, and the most high God their Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, 
being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away, and he did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned their rivers into blood and their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labour to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation and trouble by sending angels of destruction among them. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague and destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so that they did not fear. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies and he brought them to his holy border. This mountain, which his right hand had acquired, he also drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, and he beat back his enemies. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has established forever. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young he brought him, to shepherd Jacob his people, and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and guided them by the skilfulness of his hands." The reviews of Israel's past highlight God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness. They also should teach coming generations not to repeat their ancestors' mistakes, but to trust God and to remain faithful to his covenant. The psalmist uses history as a parable, as he read in verse 2. I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old, which means that the people should deeply ponder the psalm's message and search for the meaning for themselves. Psalm 78 verse 2 is a prophetic description of Jesus' method of teaching in parables, as you read in Matthew chapter 13 verses 34 to 35. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world.
The psalm also reflects on the time of the Exodus in verses 9 to 54, the settlement in Canaan from 55 to 64, and the time of David from 65 to 72. It demonstrates God's glorious deeds and the consequences of the people's breaking of their covenant with God. Israel's history recounts many forms of the people's disloyalty to God, especially their idolatry, as he says in verse 58. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. The psalmist, however, stresses the root of the Israelites' unfaithfulness. They forgot what God had done for them, did not trust God, put God to the test. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies, rebelled against Him and failed to keep His law, His covenant and His testimonies. They did not keep the covenant of God, they refused to walk in his law, for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep his testimonies. By stressing these specific forms of disloyalty, the psalmist implies that the rejection of Israel in history has resulted from one core sin, namely, the people's failure to trust the Lord. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. They may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. When reading the psalm, one is overwhelmed with the people's constant stubbornness and spiritual blindness in contrast to the Lord's boundless patience and grace. How is each new generation so slow to learn? Before we get overly judgmental of past generations, we should consider ourselves. Aren't we also forgetful of God's past wonders and neglectful of His covenantal requirements? The psalm does not encourage people to rely on their own deeds. Instead, Psalm 78 shows the futility of human will unless it is grounded in constant awareness of God's faithfulness and an acceptance of His grace. The unsuccessful battles of God's people in Psalm 78 verse 9 And verses 62 to 64 elucidate the psalm's lesson that human efforts, apart from faithfulness to God, are doomed to end in failure. Verse 9 reads, The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. And in verses 62 to 64... He also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed the young men and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. So to finish today, what lessons have you learned or should have learned from your past mistakes? Monday, March 4, Remembering History and the Praise of God. Read Psalm 105, what historical events and their lessons are highlighted in this psalm. Psalm 105, beginning at verse 1. O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. 
Remember his marvellous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance, when they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread and sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters, and he was laid in irons, until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house, and ruler of all his possessions, to bind his princes at his pleasure, and teach his elders wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob dwelt in the land of Ham. He increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they did not rebel against his word. He turned their waters into blood and killed their fish. Their land abounded with frogs, even in the chambers of the king. He spoke, and there were swarms of flies and lice in all their territory. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He struck their vines also in their fig trees and splintered the trees of their territory. He spoke, and locusts came, young locusts without number, and ate up all the vegetation in their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. He also destroyed all the firstborn in their land, the first of all their strength. He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. The people asked, and he brought quail. He satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise the Lord. Psalm 105 recalls key events that shaped the covenantal relationship between the Lord and his people Israel. It focuses on God's covenant with Abraham to give the promised land to him and his descendants and how this promise, confirmed to Isaac and Jacob, was providentially fulfilled through Joseph, Moses and Aaron and in the time of the conquest of Canaan. The psalm gives hope to God's people in all generations because God's marvellous works in the past guarantee God's unchanging love to his people in all times, as he read in verses 1 to 5. O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvellous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. And verses 7 and 8. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations 
Psalm 105 resembles Psalm 78, as we read in yesterday's lesson, in highlighting God's faithfulness to his people in history and does so in order to glorify God and to inspire faithfulness. However, unlike Psalm 78, Psalm 105 does not mention the people's past mistakes. This psalm has a different purpose. Instead, history is retold in Psalm 105 through the lives of Israel's greatest patriarchs, showing God's providential leading and the patriarchs' quiet endurance of hardships. The patriarchs' perseverance and loyalty to God were richly rewarded. Thus, Psalm 105 invites people to emulate the patriarchs' faith and trustingly wait on God's deliverance in their time. Psalm 105 possesses a hymnal note in verses 1 to 7, showing that in order to truly praise God, God's people need to know the facts of their history. History provides both validation for our faith and countless reasons for praising God. The worshippers are addressed as the seed of Abraham and children of Jacob in verse 6, therefore deeming them to be the fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham to make him a great nation. As we read in Genesis 15 verses 5 and 6, then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness." The psalmist underscores the continuity between the patriarchs and the subsequent generations of God's people. The psalmist stresses that his judgments are in all the earth in verse 7 of Psalm 105, thereby admonishing the worshippers not to forget that our God is also the sovereign Lord of the whole world and that his loving kindness extends to all people, as also emphasised in Psalm 96 verse 1, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all all the earth, and in the following Psalm 97, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of the isles be glad. It is, clearly, a call to faithfulness to every generation of believers. And so to finish the day, how should we, as Seventh-day Adventists, see ourselves in this line of people from Abraham on? Well, let's look at Galatians 3 and verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What lessons should we learn from this history? Tuesday, March 5, Remembering History and Repentance. Read Psalm 106, what historical events and their lessons are highlighted in this psalm. Psalm 106, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favour you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance." We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders, they did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. 
Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. When they envied Moses in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of Abiram. A fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the moulded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Saviour, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen one stood before him in the breach, to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents, and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand in an oath against them, to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor, and ate sacrifices made to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped, and that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on account of them, because they rebelled against his spirit, so that he spoke rashly with his lips." They did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them, and even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood, thus they were defiled by their own works, and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people, so that he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times he delivered them, but they rebelled in their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercies. He also made them to be pitied by all those who carried them away captive." Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Psalm 106 also evokes the major events in Israel's history, including the Exodus, sojourn in the wilderness, and life in Canaan. It stresses the heinous sins of the fathers that culminated in the generation that was carried into exile. Thus, the psalm almost certainly was written when the nation was in Babylon, or after they had returned home, and the psalmist, inspired by the Holy Spirit, recounted for God's people these historical incidents and the lessons that the people should have learned from them. This psalm, too, as the others, points to God's faithfulness, to his covenant of grace, by which he saved his people in the past. Verse 45 tells us that, And for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercies. 
It expresses hope that God will again show favour to his repentant people and gather them from among the nations. Verse 47, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles and give thanks to your holy name to triumph in your praise. The plea for present deliverance is not some wishful thinking, but a prayer of faith based on the assurance of God's past deliverances. As we saw in verses 1 to 3, Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. And the unfailing character of God's faithfulness to his covenant with his people. The recollection of Israel's historical failures in Psalm 106 is an integral part of the people's confession of their sins and acknowledgement that they are not better than their forefathers. The present generation admits that it is even worse than its ancestors because it knew the consequences of the past generation's iniquities and how God exercised his great patience and grace in saving them even though they had deliberately walked in wicked ways in the past. If this were true for them, think about how much more so for us today, who have the revelation of God's character and saving grace as revealed in Jesus and the cross. The good news of Psalm 106 is that God's steadfast love always prevails over the people's sins, as we read in verses 8 to 10 and 30 and 43 to 46. The key role of Moses and Phineas in turning away God's wrath points to the significance of Christ's intercession on behalf of believers. Only personal experience of God's grace can transform a past story into our story. Psalm 106 verse 13 reads, They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. Why is that so easy for us to do in our own lives as well? Wednesday, March 6, The Parable of the Lord's Vine Read Psalm 80, how are God's people portrayed in this psalm, and what great hope do they plead for? Beginning at verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in great measure. You have made us a strife to our neighbours and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine, and the vineyard which your right hand has planted, and the branch that you made strong for yourself, it is burned with fire." It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of the man whom you made strong for yourself, that we will not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved." 
Israel is portrayed as a vineyard that God uprooted from Egypt, the land of oppression, and transported to the promised land of abundance. The image of a vineyard conveys God's election of Israel and his providential care. And we're referred here to Genesis 49 verses 11 and 12, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well, his branches run over the wall. And Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 to 11, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all people. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. However, in Psalm 80, God's vineyard is under his wrath, as we read in verse 12. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The prophets announce the vineyard's destruction as the sign of God's judgment because the vine has turned bad. As you read in Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding her vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, Please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned, and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And Jeremiah 2, verse 21, Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? However, Psalm 88 does not ponder over the reasons for divine judgment. Given the depths of God's grace, the psalmist is perplexed that God can withhold his presence from his people for such an extended time. The tension between God's wrath and judgment, on the one hand, and God's grace and forgiveness, on the other, causes the psalmist to fear that divine wrath may prevail and consume the people completely, as we uh, read in Psalm 80, verse 16. It is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Read Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. How is this blessing used by Psalm 80? Psalm 6, beginning at verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. The psalmist's refrain evokes Aaron's promise of God's perpetual blessing on his people in Numbers 6, to 27 and highlights the hope that God's grace will triumph over the causes of the people's misery. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved, we read in Psalm 80, verse 3. And we'll also compare that with verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. And verse 19, Restore us, O Lord God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. The Hebrew word for restore here comes from a common word that means to return, and it is used again and again in the Bible, with God calling his people, who have wandered away, to return to him. It is closely linked to the idea of repentance, of turning away from sin and back to God. Jeremiah 24 verse 7 reads, then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. And so to finish today, how have you experienced for yourself repentance as a return to God? Thursday, March 7, The Lord's Supremacy in History Read Psalm 135. What historical events are highlighted in the psalm? What lessons does the psalmist draw from them? Psalm 135. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and in earth in the seas, and in all deep places. He causes the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king King of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord... Bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Psalm 135 summons God's people to praise the Lord for his goodness and faithfulness demonstrated in creation in verses 6 and 7 of this psalm and in Israel's salvation history in the time of the Exodus, as we read in verses 8 and 9, and in the conquering of the promised land, we read in 10 and 11. The Lord demonstrated his grace by choosing the people of Israel as his special treasure. 
special treasure, conveys the distinctive covenantal relationship between the Lord and his people, as expressed in Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments, which I command you today, to observe them. And First Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy mercy. The choosing of Israel was based on the Lord's sovereign will, and thus Israel has no ground to feel superior over the other peoples. Psalm 135 verses 6 and 7 demonstrates that the Lord's sovereign purposes for the world did not begin with Israel, But with the creation, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. He causes the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Therefore, Israel should humbly fulfil its assigned role in God's salvific purposes for the entire world. The recounting of God's great deeds on behalf of his people in verses 8 to 13 culminates in the promise that God will judge his people and have compassion on them in verse 14. For the Lord will judge his people and he will have compassion on his servants. The judgment here is God's vindication of the oppressed and the destitute. As we read in Psalm 9 verse 4, For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne, judging in righteousness. And verse 8 of uh, Psalm 7, The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. And Psalm 54 verse 1, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. And Daniel 7, 22, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. The promise is that the Lord will uphold his people's cause and defend them. We read this in Deuteronomy 32, verse 36. For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone, and there is no one remaining, bond or free. Thus, Psalm 135 aims to inspire God's people to trust in the Lord and to remain faithful to their covenant with him. The Lord's faithfulness to his people leads the psalmist to affirm the nothingness of idols and to the unique supremacy of the Lord in the world. Reliance on idols renders their worshippers as hopeless and powerless as their idols are. We read in verse 18, Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. The psalm demonstrates that God is to be praised as both creator and saviour of his people. This is wonderfully conveyed in the two complementary versions of the fourth commandment of the Decalogue. We read them in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. In the second reiteration we find in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Because God's power in creation and history is unparalleled in the world, God's people should always rely on Him and worship Him alone. As our Creator and our Redeemer, He alone should be praised, and worship of anything else or anyone else is idolatry. And so to finish the day, how can we make sure that we don't have idols in our own lives? Why might idolatry be easier to do than we realise? Friday, March 8, Further Thought The historical Psalms are a powerful witness to God's fidelity to His people. Each event in the history of God's people was a providential step leading toward the final fulfilment of the divine promise of the world's Saviour in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Even the trials, which often perplex God's people and made them think that God had abandoned them, were under God's sovereign control and part of His providence because God is the supreme Lord of history. The psalmist skillfully presents the truth that even the people's disloyalty cannot prevent God from keeping faith to his people and fulfilling his promises. However, the unrepentant individuals and groups were excluded from the covenantal blessings and their infamous end serves as a lasting warning of how life without or opposed to God destroys people. The Psalms encourage God's children in all times to hope in the Lord and remain faithful to Him. As we read in Life Sketches of Ellen White, page 196, We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. End of quote. For God's people to go forward fearlessly, they need to know the facts of their history. Ellen G. White advises believers to read Psalms 105 and 106 at least once each week, and that's in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 98. The history of God's people demonstrates that no promise that God has made in His Word will be left unfulfilled. This includes both divine promises of present individuals, care, and future promises of Christ's second coming, which will establish God's kingdom of justice and peace on the new earth. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what are the blessings of remembering God's faithful leading of his people in history? What are the consequences of forgetting or ignoring the lessons of the past? How can we apply that same principle to us as a church called to do the same thing that ancient Israel had been called to do. Two, how do the Psalms encourage us to recognise God's providential care in our life and to exercise patience and trust in God's sovereign ways, even when it's not easy to understand why things are happening as they are? 
And three, how can we make the study of the history of God's people more prominent in our personal and communal worship services? How can we be more intentional in telling our children about the more recent history of God's people? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. No Work, No Food, Part 6 by Andrew McChesney After Sekule refused to work for several Sabbaths, his commanding military officer began to understand that he could not compel the young soldier to violate his conscience. So, you can't work on the Sabbath in the army, the officer said. That's right, I can't work on the Sabbath, Sekule said. From Friday evening to Saturday evening. Yes, I can't work. Then you can't eat during those 24 hours. Why can't I eat? If you're not working, you don't need to eat. Eating is working. Also, some of the food is prepared on your Sabbath, so you shouldn't eat it. Sukule was eating only bread and drinking tea because the other military rations contained lard. But he agreed not to eat bread and drink tea that was prepared on the Sabbath. As a recently baptised Seventh-day Adventist, he wasn't sure that food prepared on the Sabbath was off-limits. But he needed to give an answer that met the officer's expectations. If he had refused to work but demanded bread and tea, the officer would think that he was being unfaithful to God. Several months had passed and the military cooks began to cook one meal a week without lard. It was the only meal that Sekule could eat but it was prepared and served only on the Sabbath. Sukule prayed, God, please, could you change the day from Sabbath to Sunday? Would you do that for me? He prayed for a month and the lard free meal was moved to Sunday. Sunday happened to be a recreational day for the soldiers, a time when they could relax by playing soccer, basketball and other sports. Sukule wished that the recreational day was on the Sabbath. It would be easier for him to refuse to play soccer than to refuse to work every Sabbath. He prayed again. I'm sorry, but could I ask you one more thing? Could you move the recreational day from Sunday to Sabbath so I don't need to explain every Sabbath why I can't work? A week after the lard free meal was changed to Sunday, the recreational day suddenly was moved to Saturday. Sekuli Sekules is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful Seventh-day Adventist in Montenegro. We'll read more of his story next week and thank you for your Sabbath school mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus soon coming in Montenegro and around the world. <music> 